try again. Hello? No, nothing in here. The same for no speakers in here, it won't come through, will it? Yeah, but you kind of hear it like this. Oh, that's not. There are two speakers. Other speakers. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Hello? I don't know, you cannot really say it, can you? <laughs> we'll try it, see what happens. Yeah. You can either record or it won't. I don't think I've ever heard anybody else coming through in this room. Didn't speak. Yeah. Just might get, a, might get a blank presentation with no audio. Okay. I just think someone. Uh, okay, no problems. Be a nice quiet one. See? One, two. Oh. Alex, how are you doing? Was this EGLT? Yeah. Yeah, got an issue with my phone in ELGOT. The microphone is not supposed to work in the OGO2, it's not being forced, it's just for the recording. Is that the lapel or is that another one? The table microphone you can take out the stand. It's a small room, so if you have reinforced speakers in there, it would be a bit overkill. I it's recording then. Okay, so I assume that records. Uh, yeah, if you take it out of the stand, then just use it like a regular mic. You won't have the reinforcement, but it'll be much better for the recording. Does that mean he wants you to take it out? Or I, think he, I guess it's one of the... Yeah, okay, we'll get it to take it out. Yeah, so it won't just... Come down or you okay? Yeah, pop down, that's alright. <laughs> <laughs> is that meant to be working like that, or is that just... I don't know, we had the issue with this one last year. Reinforcement means it's not going to come through there. No. Yeah. It's small, too small a room, isn't it, for it to be way about, but... We just want to make sure it does a recording, because last year, a few of the recordings didn't work. Right. It was like a wicked sound, like you were in a fishbowl. Yeah, they're not sure if the microphone's running or not. So. 
we'll get started in a few minutes, hopefully. I think it's more for the recording, really. But, uh, Sorry, yeah, that's I right. Should yeah. Explain about this no, don't worry, I've got the same. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's fine as it is. Just I mean, you can have it on your person or yeah. you can leave it down here. But no, it's yeah. just for quality of audio. And yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'll stick it on. Yeah, if you want to go right there. Brilliant. Okay. Has someone actually got it recording or? Uh, yeah, I've set up the recording. Oh, oh yeah, it's automatic. Yeah. It? yeah, I remember like last year. Right. Um, I'm just going to take one of these away. Yes, yeah, there was one that was in the room, so. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. I should say, yeah. <coughs> Let's get going. Cup of seat. Do you want me? <laughs> Uh, we'll get going now, as hope you're all sorted. And so, um, my name is Mike Davis. I'm a lead developer at Decent, uh, a Drupal agency that's uh, working with other platforms like WordPress and Arrow and stuff as well. But um, this afternoon's talk is on an application we've got called Warden. Um, I don't know if we've got any developers in here at all today. A few? That's okay. Well, for those who aren't, don't worry, there's no code on this one. This is um, the application called Warden, which is, um, I'll run through in a minute, but uh, a system which kind of helps report on the sites you maintain as your different agencies. So these days, online security is a massive deal, isn't it? Everyone's talking about it. All, all over. Everything's going online. It needs to be checking what's going on with security, checking how logins are happening, whether we've got SSL, whether we've got um, password protection, various different levels. Um, it's really kind of it's a big thing, big thing at the moment. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I used to be able to remember all the passwords I needed for my email accounts, my online bank, everything. There was kind of even though I had different passwords, different things. There was only a handful of um, things you had. And I, could, I had about 10 passwords. I, th I felt pretty good. I've got 100 or 10 passwords. Nowadays, with the different things we've got, the levels of security, the two factor authentication, um, you need other things. Um, but it, it's, security is a massive deal that we're looking at these days with everything we're doing. Chrome stated at the end of uh, last year that starting at the beginning of this year, actually they're going to start flagging up sites which don't have SSL certificates and marking them as insecure. I think starting in around about March time, with a late update they'll be releasing then, it'll not only be a grey box saying insecure, it'll start saying a red box saying insecure, which obviously is a quite big flag for a lot of people. So when people are using our sites, we need to make sure that actually we're making sure that our sites have SSL certificates on them. Security is on our clients' agendas. Quite often nowadays we're finding that clients are making, wanting to make sure that what we're doing to make sure their data is secure what we're doing to make sure the platform that we're running on is secure. So they're actually thinking about it as well and wanting to pay attention to what's going on with that. Drupal Geddon, I don't know how many of you will be aware of this. Um, I'm sure many of you will be. It's a massive security breach, that, well it's not breach, but a vulnerability that was announced in, in uh, Drupal a couple of years ago. Um, they reckoned if you hadn't applied the patch within about six hours, seven hours of it being announced, your site was most likely to be hacked. At that point there, you're better off to take your site down, restore from a backup, and bring it back up again, because the data on there could have been breached and could have been, had been uh, tampered with in some way. Um, the Panama Papers, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so that I mean, it was, a, it was a massive deal for Drupal community. Um, I think we've got press, probably worldwide, certainly nationally and stuff, and there's a lot of press about it. Um, but yeah, a, a big thing and something we need to make sure of. Uh, we actually need to make sure, have we updated our sites? How do we know we've got updated our sites? How do we know we've got everything handled with that? Um, and important to know from our client's perspective that actually we as agencies are on top of this, that when we get an announcement like this, we can actually update our sites quickly and efficiently. 
and um, know whether we've actually updated everything. So in this age, security is a big thing. How much does it really matter? Online security and other things. Well, Carphone Warehouse were fined £400,000 recently, fought by the ICA, due to um, serious failures placing customer and employer data at risk. They had an audit of their site, they were using a WordPress site that was found to be out of date, considerably out of date, exposed to the internet and suffering from multiple vulnerabilities. Because it was out of date, the vulnerabilities are there. Their attacker, be it a sort of safe attacker if you like, um, was able to exploit the vulnerabilities because they could tell what version was running, they could isolate things and they could access a the site. They got customer data, they even got credit card data about customers. If this had been an actual attack by a hacker, by someone who was fishing around trying to see what's going on, the amount of data that they would have got and the level of data they would have got was very serious. That they could have used it for all kinds of malicious behaviour. Um, so it was a big thing. And I mean, Carphone Warehouse is a big name, but they have come to this kind of thing as well. So they were fined £400,000 just as last month for that. But with the introduction of GDPR coming out in March this year, that fine is likely to increase to around £20 million. So this is a big thing. This is something that clients need to be aware of need to be on top, know that we're on top of this as agencies that are managing their sites, that are actually want maintaining their sites and providing a service for them. Incidentally, if you're still unsure about GDPR, these have issued a white paper, which is a very good read, explaining it very clearly for those who are not sure about it. So where does that leave us with Drupal? Well, Drupal, as hopefully most of you may know, they've got their own security team. They have a, people in the community who are helping to understand what's going on with core code, but also module code. When vulnerabilities are submitted around modules or core, they're isolated, they're dealt with by the security team and module maintainers. They are helping to keep the code secure where they can. They issue out weekly notifications, usually by email, there's a um, post on Drupal.org which lists out the security announcements. You can get an RSS feed from that. Uh, we have one that runs into our Slack account, so we can actually tell everyone what's going on with that. It's um, something that all your developers really should be signed up to. Uh, so if they're not, make sure they are, because we want to be aware of what security announcements are coming out um, and being aware of how that affects our sites. <coughs> the fact that we have this security team I think it's a big plus for Drupal. It's something we can sell to our clients. It's something that we can help encourage our clients in and actually saying, well, Drupal as a whole, as a system, make sure that your site is going to be up to date. Yes, it's up to us to make sure we update it, but there is premise in place and systems in place to make sure that as long as we are doing our job and updating it, that it's kept up to date and it's not going to fall behind. So, a little bit of background on what we can do with Drupal. Um, Drupal has a status page which tells you whether it's updated or not. There's the module listing page which uses traffic light system to tell you whether it's out of date or it's got security updates. It's great, great for a single site. But you, if you actually, most of us here, I'm sure, have got more than one site that we're all dealing with. And so, to trawl through those and trawl through the sites can be quite time consuming to run through and check what which sites actually need updates and um, how it's going to affect that site. Pantheon, Acquia, common Drupal hosting solutions, they provide in their dashboards an overview of the security updates as well. So you actually don't have to log into your site so you can see it from your dashboards. Now, that's great, but it's one level above maybe. Um, it does require your developers to log in to their to Acquia account, uh, assuming they have access to all the different sites you have on Acquia, to actually go through each of the sites in turn and check to see whether they've got security announcements or security updates pending on there. Once they've done that with Acquia, they may have to move across to Pantheon and move it on there. 
I imagine most of us probably don't just have sites on Acme and Pantheon. We might then have them on Platform SH, even on AWS or other custom hosting platforms. These ones, these different platforms, don't provide that kind of dashboard to actually give you a sense of what's going on. So you still have to then go into these sites, check whether these sites need updating or not, and for the developers to actually run through and find out across your state of sites that you hold as an agency which ones are affected by a core update, which hopefully we most of them, but module updates that come out as well. We at Decent uh, faced this exact same problem several years ago, and each week when the security announcements came out, we were kind of scrubbed around, trying to find, find out which sites were available, everyone's on hand, update, making updates, working out what we need to do. Were we sure we had captured everything? You end up with spreadsheets, you end up with all different reporting stuff, trying to find out whether you get what's happening and whether you've actually managed to update all your sites or not. Um, through looking around, trying to find out other solutions uh, where we could do this, we came across um, this module called System Status, um, which at the time was a, um, reported into an online dashboard, which was a free service, which captured your information from the site, had a dashboard there to handle it, and meant that you have all the information available to you. The company has um, now become known as Lemurio and is a paid-for service uh, which offers a central dashboard, offers updates and things on there. Um, feel free to check it out. It is a good system. Um, it looks like it, did it, well, it does everything we wanted to do. The problem we had as an agency was it was passing all our client data onto another third-party company. We weren't necessarily that happy about doing that. When you've got all your different sites that you're managing and you've got potential security updates needing and you're passing to a third-party company, we weren't too comfortable with that. Especially at the time, it was a free service. We didn't know what they were doing with that data. We didn't know where they were going to go, what the company was going to do. We spoke to the module maintainer for system status um, to see whether there's any way you could have a, an off-the-shelf um, sort of install it where you want system um, where we could have the system install it on our own server somewhere so that we maintain the data for it and it wasn't held by them. Although this was an idea that he, wanted, he liked and was floating around, it wasn't something that fitted their business at the time. Um, and so, I say, feel free to have a look at them. Um, it seems to be a good system, seem to match and tick those boxes, but certainly for us, it didn't seem to um, sit well with us at the time. We wanted to be in control of our data, we wanted to be, make sure that we were aware of what was going on. So, we developed Warden. Uh, what started off as a little bit of an internal um, pro project to see what we could do with it, see what we could take from the lessons we learned from system status to develop something which would um, be a central reporting tool. That gave, it is a high level reporting tool that means that you can see all your sites you deal with as an agency. It doesn't matter where they're hosted Platform SH, AWS. Acquia, Pantheon, your own custom hosting, your next door neighbour's server, wherever it is, it can report the data from your Drupal sites into Warden through the Drupal module. Warden application itself uses Drupal's only security API to update itself to understand what the latest versions are, so it can match those and understand and see your sites. So you've then got a central place where you can actually see which sites have been affected by the updates. Because we wanted to make it um, so that other people could use it, I haven't got something established. It's now available on GitHub. You can download it, install it. I'll caveat that in terms of it does require a little bit of DevOps. It's a simply based application, so it requires a server or system somewhere that can support Symfony. Um, it also runs off MongoDB currently, so as long as you've got that set up and you can configure that, you can install it and get it running on there. It means that you're then in control of your data. You as an agency maintain that data. Nobody else has got it. As long as you've got your own secure servers and you maintain that, then you're handling that data. It's your clients, your data. Nobody else can tamper with it. No one else can see what's going on with it. It's up to you how you manage that and what you do with it. But it means that you have a central place for all your sites to understand where they are, understand what needs to be updated. Can it be installed with uh, Composer? Yes, yeah, so it's installed by... Yeah, 
Yes, so it's a standard Symfony application, so once you've downloaded it, install it using Composer, and it goes off as normal. So yeah, that's, yeah. So, what does Warden really do? It's seen a high level thing. When you log in, it gives you a central dashboard, highlighting all sites which have got a security update pending on them. Be it that a core update, or it could even be a straightforward module update. You might have one or two modules that have be released in a security <coughs> announcement which need updating. They will show up on the dashboard as well. This gives you a central place where you can go. All your developers can log in, access it, see what needs to be done. They can dish out the, the different sites between the team if they want to, or if there's various sites they know they maintain, they can go, well, yep, I've got that, that, and that, and I'm doing this. And Between them, they know what they need to do. Once the update's been released and pushed out to production <coughs> servers, this can update, and therefore you can see that list of juicy, hopefully, during the day, and therefore you can pick off and say, actually, well, okay, we've still not got this site done, what do we need to do with this? And it's a way of centrally managing what sites have been updated and what we still need to do. The update process runs on a Quan job, so you can have it run overnight or every hour or however you want to do it, um, but it means that you can actually run it through and keep an eye on what's going on with the sites we've got on there. It also provides a full list of sites that you have. So the dashboard shows you which ones need updating. You've also got a full list of sites. It also highlights which ones have got an update pending. But it means you can see a full list of everything that you've got going on with your state, the sites, the clients you deal with. You can actually have a look at that. You can monitor that. You can see how that's going. And just gives you a full list of what's going on, rather than having to perhaps scrabble around with different spreadsheets you might have, or someone's got a list here and someone's got a list there. And it helps to bring everything together. Within each site, we also show the information about that site. So, core modules, that's the core version, the list of modules that are available for that site, installed on that site. And alongside that, we also then break it down in terms of, well, which versions are they using, whether those versions are out of date, or whether they need a security release on them. So you see on that one, that top one's highlighted in red, and the others that need a security update, whereas the ones previous or further down in yellow, they're just out of date. So you can manage that as you need to on there, whether you worry about those or not, or whether you have a process again where, okay, they're all out of date, we need to update them all, or over time you can keep them up to date and maintain the actual, they may not have a security update, but you can still make sure that your modules are up to date. Too many times you, you go through the process of building a site, get everything ready, make sure your modules are up to date before going live, go live, six, 12 months later you come back and look at it and everything's out of date because everything's been, had module updates and version updates and things going on. You've kept core possibly up to, probably up to date with security updates that come out, but you have a, a ton of modules where they're 15 versions or 12 versions out of date. Um, in one sense, that might be all right. Depends on how you look at it. If it's not got a security update, it's fine. But also, we have had problems where a module has been six, eight, ten minor releases out of date, and then a security update comes out. And suddenly, we have a world of pain because we have to update ten minor versions, and in, that, in those minor versions, various different changes have gone on, and we end up by finding that there's been um, a whole bunch of different things that happen, problems to solve, issues to deal with from doing such a jump of versions. At least running through this, you can see what your version differences are. You can have a process of not only making sure that your sites are up to date with security versions, but also of actually saying, well, okay, is there a threshold of what minor versions we want to go to? Are we happy for it to go for more than three or four minor versions? And you can then manage that with your developers, manage that with how you want to update your sites with that. It'll also update and show you if a release has become unsupported. There might be a 2.x version, which is currently running, and you've got version 2.4 on the Drupal 7, for instance, and the module maintainer has now released a 3.x version and marked the 2.x as unsupported. They're no longer supporting that version. You're still using it, and not aware, and the site's running fine, but actually, Warden will help to understand that. Warden will highlight those and show them to be unsupported. So you can see that on the site, you can see that on the individual um, site page, and so take action as to what you want to do with that. 
again, you, it's up to you through the, how you manage that. You may be happy leaving it where it is. The site's working, you don't want to touch it. Fine. Equally, actually jumping from a 2.x release to a 3.x release might give you more functionality, might be better, but also in this instance where a security update comes out, you might be a security update in the 3.4 version. You've then got to jump from a 2.4 to a 3.4 and deal with the headache of that. So it helps to give you an overview of what's going on with your site. Again, it's kind of keeping information in one place, helping you and your developers to understand what's going on with the site and keep an eye on what's kind of going on with all your sites. We've also got on the list there, you've got, you've got JavaScript, PHP, and server variables. We've got, a, we've got another mechanism in place where you can actually report on third party libraries used. So we can report on the JavaScript libraries that are used within your sites, the PHP libraries that are used in the sites. So you can see what versions you're using across the different sites you're on there. We, um, we've used the server one more for kind of knowing what PHP version we're using. We don't tend to go into necessarily details or we haven't at the moment of knowing what Nginx version or Varnish version or anything else around detailed server variables are used. Um, but PHP version is quite an interesting one because it can it comes under life. We had a little while ago where PHP 5.3 was under life and we had to go around all your sites making sure which ones were running on that version and make sure they've upgraded and updated and updated your Acquia settings to run PHP 5.6 and how does that affect your sites. So actually knowing what versions of PHP your sites are running on is useful. There might be limitations to do with hosting you're running on, that you have to run it on a certain PHP version. That's fine, but at least you've got somewhere you can see what's going on with that. So as well as seeing the sites and seeing the information about sites, we also look at it from the other side of things. So we have a full list of all the modules that are used across all your sites. And it, you can see there the, the number of sites that are using the modules. So you can actually get a breakdown of what's going on and you can see where they're used. When you go into view an individual module, you get a breakdown of the versions available, but you also get a breakdown of what sites are using that module. So, if you've had a security announcement come out for a particular module, we had um, Entity API the other week, you could look up Entity API, see which sites were affected by that module, and prepare yourself for what needs to be going on, what's, what's happening with that. It could be, actually, you have a best practice internally in terms of what modules you want to install on your sites. You need to make sure all your sites are running particular modules or particular subset of modules that you want to make sure you're using. Again here you can make sure you can come in and see are there any sites aren't using the module and therefore in the situation where you've got that you might say yeah for instance path auto you might want obviously the classic one used on all these sites but for some reason if there's a site that's not using it why is that? There might be a valid reason but equally it's checking that's what's going on you can see what's happening you can see which sites aren't using your modules a good use case for this was recently, um, I think it was in January, or just before Christmas, I can't remember, um, but Acquia released a notification saying that their search module needed to be updated to the latest version by the end of January. Acquia were changing the way that they were handling their search and that you needed to make sure that any sites that were using Acquia search needed to be on, I think it was 2.4 or 2.8 version of their module. So we went to Warden. Looked at the modules, found Acquia Search module. Easily got a list of all the sites that were using Acquia Search. You can see from that list which versions they were using. So when they had the latest version, fine, don't need to do it, anything with them. Those that had an older version, we can then plan in and say, okay, right, here's five or six sites which are using an older version. We need to make sure that we've got that booked in with the various developers to update that module to make sure it's using the right version, the latest version of Acquia Search before the end of January. So we had a few weeks to do it. But you can plan that into the developer's day. You can plan that in as when it's going to be done and make sure it's done before the end of January. And we can check back to Warden on a weekly basis. Did we have it updated? Which sites will still need to be updated? So when it came to the end of January and Acquia changed their search interface and the way their search worked, we knew that all the sites that we were using it were fine. There wasn't going to be a problem. Had we not known that, it's more a question of you have to go through all the sites, you have to work out what's going on and really find out which sites were doing it, which can be quite a time consuming exercise. I mentioned the third parties, third party libraries on the sites. Again, like the module page, we've got a third party library page which gives an overview of all the third party libraries that are used. Um, 
JavaScript PHP. Which again, you can see how many sites are using it, and then by drilling down into it, see which sites those are and what versions they're using. Third party libraries is an interesting one. Uh, we spent some time looking around to see whether we could find out a central place to deal with vulnerabilities, um, security announcements for JavaScript libraries, PHP libraries. There isn't really anything we can find. If you know of any, please tell me. But there was one, live, one central place that dealt with some of them, but it didn't deal with all of them. And then there's something else that dealt with some others, and not all of them. And there was cross pollination between them. And it became a big mess as to try and work out how you could sensibly find a, find a solution to check all of these different libraries as to whether there was any announcement for them. And even the fact that whether a particular JavaScript library or PHP library even gave security announcements. So, although we can't report on any security announcements against the libraries, you've got a central place where you can look at what's going on. That if you're keeping an eye on announcements that come out from various different providers for JavaScript libraries, for PHP libraries, that you can actually see which sites might be affected. So although this doesn't, won't update you and won't tell you when there's updates, it still gives you that central place you can go to. So when you're monitoring things or you're aware of an update that needs to be done to jQuery or Seek Editor or um, some other PHP library, uh, you can actually come and find out which ones are using that and then take appropriate action to update your sites. There is an email notification that can be sent out from Warden. This again is triggered by a, uh, triggered by a cron command. So you can send it out on a weekly basis following security update announcements from the security team. So come Thursday morning, your developers can have a nice email in their inbox detailing which sites need to be updated. So they don't necessarily have to log in to Warden to see it. They can have a list there to what they want to do and how they want to do with it. It might be that you want to trigger that to various managers and the team or anything else so that equally they don't have to log in, but they're aware that actually there's sites that need updating. Um, this gives the same information essentially as what's on the dashboard. Uh, so it's the sites that require security updates. So it's not any update, it's just a security update because they're obviously the critical ones we want to report on. So Warden gives a central place for storing your sites, a central place for detailing which sites need updating and have security updates pending. It makes it easy for your developers to be able to identify which sites need updating and take appropriate action and be able to see whether they've been updated or not. So you can see that list disappear down. You can actually know that all your sites have been dealt with and updated. There's no more pain of them going around trying to spend hours working out which sites need updating. It makes you more efficient. Your developers can deal with it, deal with it in, in time, and then move on with their day. We found, we've been using uh, Warden now for the last two years internally, and we found our developers have come to rely on it. It's become as part of our tool set that we use on a weekly basis. When it comes when the security announcements come out, everyone jumps on and has a look at what's going on, what sites are affected. Oh great, okay, we've got these three sites to be deal with tomorrow. Um, or okay, who's going to do this site, who's going to do that site? And they, they self-organise themselves, they manage what's going on. They can easily deal and see what's going on and see how things are going. And actually, if the site hasn't been updated and someone else has finished their sites and do to update, they can jump on and go, okay, I'll do that, I'll sort that out. And they work as a team together and it works really well. They're very clear as to what needs to be done and where, what they can do with it. So, the future of Warden. It's, as I say, it's on GitHub. It's on uh, available open source to um, use and download. Um, there is an issue queue on there that we've been using to report things internally with stuff on there. Um, there are other users using it um, I think across Europe. We've had quite a few users that expressed interest and um, are starting to use it on their systems. But we're, what we're looking at for the next release is um, Slack notifications. Um, I'm sure many people use Slack nowadays. It seems to be everywhere. But uh, we've got um, we have Slack notifications of the incoming security notifications from the RSS feed from Drupal.org, but we don't have anything that details actually what sites that affects us with. So we're looking at having a Slack notification in the same way the email notification can come in, but it can come into our Slack channel. Again, it's making it clearly available to everyone who's a, who needs to know that actually these are the sites that need updating. It's currently only supporting Drupal sites. We want to extend that further. We want to make it more pluggable so that we can actually drop in and provide support for WordPress sites, other CMS sites, 
we can then report on the modules or the versions of systems that they provide and have a central dashboard where you can handle all the sites you're dealing with. WordPress, I don't know that they have a core update, they have the constant updates of core that you can trigger, but the modules themselves, they don't necessarily have so much of a um, an update process or an API necessarily available of detailing what security updates are, are there. Um, so although we can report, as far as I know, we can certainly report from the WordPress sites and so find out what versions, but having that same sort of level of security updates from WordPress or other CMS systems may not be as um, efficient as that. Um, if they're available, great, we can use them. But as I know at the moment, there's nothing for that as such, in the same way we have for Drupal. We're looking at potentially using the um, Drupal status page. You can trigger warning to the Drupal status page. We want to see if we can possibly look at whether we hook into that and provide certain warnings back to the dashboard, back to the Drupal site. So as developers, you might have a, um, an API you connect to for a CRM system or something, and you might want to report on problems with that. So actually, if that connection goes down or something happens, that report gets shipped up to the status page, and ultimately that's picked up by Warden's API and sent through to Warden. So actually, your dashboard can then be flagged to say there's a problem with your site, and then you can see what's going on. So there's the things like that we're looking at. We're looking also at... Um, producing a Docker image to make it easy to deploy and install Warden on a server somewhere that can support Docker, be it AWS or Docker support, supported system somewhere else. As it's open source, we want feedback from people. We've been using it, um, say, for the last two years or so. We've been making changes on it, tweaks on it, looking at how we can um, make it better and more usable for ourselves, but we don't want us to be the the actual authority of what goes on and they say so what's happening. We want other people and other agencies to be using it and actually finding out what would be useful for the whole community um, to actually make it better, make it more, um, report more information and usable information for us as a whole. Some of you may have heard of DropGuard. Um, again, like, a bit like Lemurio, it's another top system that handles updates. Uh, for those that don't know much about them, they provide a system, a solution that um, connects or uses your Git account to automatically apply updates from Drupal to it and then deploy that to an environment. Um, I've not used it myself, but it looks like a great system. It is a paid for system as well, it's a paid for solution like Lemuria, so it's something that you, you pay for and I think there is limits on the number of sites you can have and you possibly pay on a per site basis, um, so it depends on how many sites you manage and what you're dealing with on that. Um, but it does deploy to an environment. Now, it still involves, therefore, a certain amount of testing from your developers to actually check that. Uh, I wouldn't want to deploy that to a live environment. There's been uh, too many times when I've applied a module update to um, what seems like a simple module update, and suddenly my whole site's blown up because that update relied on another module updating and another mod module updating and something else to happen, and it to be a Wednesday of the third week or something, and it was like... It takes you a few hours to figure out what's going on, update what relevant needs to be done, test it, and then ship it up. So, although it's a good system, although it helps that um, flow of actually updating the system already, developers can actually check your say, dev site and see whether anything's broken or not before deploying it up manually. It's another way of looking at things. Um, again, I've got no problems with drop guards. Certainly check it out if you haven't already, and look at it as to whether it will support your business and what you're looking at. Um, but again, for us, it's a paid-for solution, and for someone, something that was connecting to our Git accounts and updating Git, we weren't as happy with that at the time. Drupal provides plenty of documentation about uh, best practice in code writing. Um, your developers should be aware of this. They should be making sure they're writing code which is uh, secure, although the security team will check and be aware of codes that's um, in core as well as in contrib modules. We all write custom modules for our sites. We all have custom behavior that sites adhere to and need uh, for what they're doing. So we need to make sure that we're writing code which is still secure. It's pointless us having the security team and managing everything else that's going on that if we create a small module which just opens up a massive hole that someone can jump into the site and access our site's data. So we need to make sure that our sanitate, the um, user inputted data is sanitized. We need to make sure we're not, we're not um, opening up holes to SQL injection. There's plenty of other security vulnerabilities we need to be aware of when we're writing code, but there's plenty of documentation that Drupal.org provides, um, and there's plenty of other stuff online that which you can 
the developers and you guys can look at to see making sure that they're actually adhering to those and writing the best code they can. Finally, a bit of marketing spiel to uh, push in there. Um, decent hiring. We are a um, specialist open source agency. Uh, we have distributed team across Europe. So we have developers across Europe working for us as well. Um, we work in Drupal, Laravel and WordPress. If you're interested, then visit the careers area. But it's a, um, yeah, we are kind of a company looking at making sure that we're actually producing what we need for our clients. That's, I think that's key in what we're doing. Finally, any questions? We have taken the stance of, um, and we, sp we speak to our clients about it, we are very clear that we want to make their sites as up to date and from a security point of view as possible. So um, most of our clients we have support contracts with, um, and so when security updates come out, we will automatically apply those updates and notify them that an update has been applied. Um, we're very clear and open with the clients about this, and we say, actually, look, we want to make sure that your sites are up to date. Um, we don't want to wait for your approval for three months for us doing a core update. If it's a security update, we generally need to get on and do it. So that's a process of kind of upfront as a kind of engagement yes. with the client to kind of say, this, this is a caveat working yeah. for us, we will do this. Yes, well, so that's yeah. That's part of your maintenance contract. And that's part of our. We will do this anyway. Yes, right. so yeah, we make sure it's part of our maintenance contract. We make sure it's part of a, um, a process within that. But the clients are very. Um, aware of that, and we're very open with our clients around that. We, we don't want to hide it, we don't want to hide it away as just some other line item in the billing, but actually, it is something that we want to make sure that they know that we're actually making sure their sites are secure and up to date. Do you do that? Sorry. Do you do that with like intermediate versions? Well, it's like the same problem. You know, if you wait 26 versions for a security update to come out, then you're in a world of pain. So, do you automatically keep updating even the smallest updates all the um, time? Yes, yeah, so in terms of intermediate updates for the small increments, um, again, we try and put that in within what we're doing as well. So um, there is a level. Sometimes we will um, engage the client a bit more around that. Um, and again, it's, it's keeping them up to date what's going on and saying to them, actually, well, we've got a few modules here which are quite far behind. They don't have a security release, but we want to make sure they're up to date. So it is, it's sometimes getting their, yeah, a lot of the time getting their approval on that as well. Um, but often, because they bought into the idea that we're wanting to make sure their sites are up to date, especially from a security point of view, then actually the idea of keeping the updates going as well, they're quite happy with. Um, and they, they buy into that and they're quite aware of it as well. I think the, the complexity as well is that a, a module might change drastically between versions because of you know, open source and development might decide they want to do it a different way. And so what looks on the surface like a quite a simple upgrade could be like weeks worth of work. So yeah, I guess that's, that's a difficult conversation, but you know, if you want to keep things up to date, yeah, certainly, yeah. For, for big jumps between a 2.x and 3.x where they've massively changed things, then yes, it, it can be, a, you can end up by spending hours trying to sort out what's going on sometimes. But um, with those big updates, again, we will notify the client, we'll say, actually, there's a big update. Yeah. The version you're on is currently out of date. It's being made, it's no longer supported. Um, we want to make sure you're on the latest copy of everything um, and make sure that when there is a security update come out, we don't have a world of pain. So we think we're going to spend a couple of hours looking at this. Yeah. And it's, again, it's a, again, there's a level of getting their approval on that as well, because it's not a, an immediate effect that needs to be happen on their site, but it's, again, it's helping them and getting them to buy into the whole process and making sure their site is up to date, um, which generally they do. I mean, yeah, most minor updates are half an hour's worth of work, check it, but yeah, sometimes you can end up four, four hours, four hours later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, touch wood, at the wall. small update, but yeah. Uh, I have a question around uh, the version number, so there's two versions. So one is uh, sometimes we in both in Drushmate as well as in Composer, we may not want to use the FTP D O version. And I believe the sites that you did like using the info file, the signature comes from D O, or do you use any other way to detect the version? So 
So, yeah, so in terms of where the vision version number comes from, uh, the version number comes from the info file yeah. of the module. So if you're, yeah. as long as you're using the um, versions in there, yeah. then it's available. If you're using make files to install and create your Drupal sites, if you're using Composer to create your Drupal sites, that's still downloading versions. Exactly. So the both in make file, I saw that the, in Composer, you use the FTP and FTP that is the only place where info file gets that uh, automatic signature. Uh, but if you use Git instead of uh, FTP, uh, because either the module has the latest version, but you need something more than that, like you need two more commits on top of it, then you can just say on the composer as well as uh, make file can say that. So it, does it cover the part like any way Okay, so yeah, the question was around kind of if you're using uh, Composer or Make to connect to a, directly to a, a Git yeah. uh, version that's not an official release necessarily. It might be the latest dev release or something on yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I mean, if, you've, if you're connected to a dev release, for instance, so you've got no official okay. version number, it's a dev release, the info file <coughs> often will say dev release in it. So right. the, um, on the Drupal.org, if you can, when you actually expose the dev version, it still has a 7. whatever hyphen dev release on it. So actually, we report on those as well. So actually, we in your listings, if it's got a dev release, we highlight those to oh. say we've got a dev release highlighted. Um, it doesn't do anything else, but it highlights the fact that actually you've got dev versions we're using. If you've actually connected to directly to the master branch and downloaded the repository straight from Git, for instance, then that's not going to have a version in the info file. So therefore, it will report essentially a blank version, and therefore it shows up in the list but it's got a blank version number on it because there's nothing for us to report on in that. Right. And then the second one is the same one, but uh, so I'm using the version, proper version, but uh, both in Make and Composer, you can do patches as well. So is there any indication saying it is deviated? You, you are in 2.10, but you have a little bit more than 2.10. No, there's no, nothing in terms of, so in terms of if you had a patch to apply to your version as well, um, there's nothing that would tell us that patches have been applied to that version. So um, we just report on, again, what the version is. So if you've got version 2.10 of the module, but you applied six patches to that module, there's nothing that we can tell at the moment that will tell us that you've got six patches applied to that. Um, it's one of those things there, if you downloaded a dev release, often it has dev hyphen, or is it, I don't know, hyphen dev plus six or something like that, that gives you kind of a, a number of commits beyond um, the master version and that kind of stuff. And, so that again, because that's in the version number that gets reported on there, but if you're um, have actually applied patches through Composer or through Makefile, then yeah, we don't we can't report on that at the moment. Um, I don't believe there's any way we can tell other than reading your Make and Composer file um, that that's happened. So uh, it would be something you'd have to look into to whether we support things like Composer files and patches and make files and patches and stuff. But. So, um, yeah, so yeah, question around Acquia have a solution for automatically updating your site through their system. Um, yes, they do. Um, it's a paid for service. Uh, you, I think you have to have an enterprise account with them. Um, they will take your production database, put it in an environment, I think usually called RA. Um, remote administration. That's it, remote administration. Um, so they'll take your production database, your production codes, put it in there, they'll apply all the patches needed. Um, and give it to you. Um, so yeah, it's a pay-for system. We we haven't had much luck with that. Yeah. They blindly apply patches and just hand it over to you. Uh, they don't even test the site. Right. Um, they literally they, just, they don't apply the security patches. They apply everything. So they'll just literally go um, drush update or something, apply all the updates, and then just go right. We've updated the site. Can you look at it? And you go and look at it, and there's a big white page <laughs> because they've not even checked what's going on, they're not aware of stuff, they just, they're, they just blindly apply anything. Um, we have one client who had the service as part of their Acquia account and they told them to turn it off, they told them to get rid of it because they weren't interested because they kept breaking the site. They were happier to pay us as part of their support contract to update the site to make sure it was updated with security updates, with module updates, because we actually made sure that it was working. 
we actually made sure that the, the relevant patches have been applied and they were actually working before releasing it. Whereas, as far as they were concerned, they were paying Acquia for the service that they weren't doing because they were applying the patches and then they were having to come to us to fix them. So, it, it, yes, it's a, it's a funny one because they apply that they have the service there, but yeah. they kind of blindly do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Great, thank you. Have you got uh, MongoDB on there? I have, yeah. Have you got the connection details in your uh, parameters file? Uh, yeah, I believe I have, yeah. Um, Straightforward standard Mongo connection that you can connect to? Uh, yeah, I, I imagine so, yeah. I mean, I'm not that familiar no, no. with it. Um, we could do that. Uh, System safety thing. I want to own my stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so it's quite nice that you get to own it, which I'm yes. quite happy with. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. We generally, we generally don't deal with customers until after they've launched, and then, and then we sort of begin. Yeah. Yeah, good to Um, Thanks, uh, Mike. Great presentation. No Very uh, intelligible, and uh, I don't know why we wouldn't be using this uh, great tool. So, <laughs> yeah, great. I'm gonna dive into Go this yes. uh, <laughs> composer rise and set it up as soon as possible. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Do you think of building it in Drupal? No, we just wanted to, we wanted to build something. We was kind of completely out of Drupal that wasn't. Yeah. Therefore, it just kind of makes it it's quite different for him. Yeah. Um, simply with a platform that enables us to. Yeah. Um, Sorry, guys, I've got a session going on here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I can get it working now. <laughs> 